Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and today I'm going to go a little bit uh, deeper into feedback loops and talk about the elements of a feedback loop. You hopefully know the difference between negative and positive feedback loops, and you could list a few like thermoregulation, blood glucose. We'll add blood calcium as we go throughout the year, and there's a, a number of feedback loops that control both inside of us and the outside of us. Uh, but I want to talk about the elements, the important elements of a feedback loop. So you're comfortable with them. And so if we think of us as a system, we're constantly getting input and we're constantly giving output, output. But that's not a feedback loop. A feedback loop doesn't really exist until we take that output and that actually feedbacks into the system. And so until we have a loop, then we really don't have a feedback loop. So what we're looking for are loops. Now, the terms should also be familiar with. In other words, you should understand what a receptor is and what an effector is, what a stimulus is and what a response is. And if you've looked at any of the feedback loops in our book, you'll start to realize that they have a, a similar pattern. In other words, the receptor is always going to be in the middle. And then you're going to kind of have a figure eight like this. So we're going to have a figure eight. What happens if it goes up too high? What happens if it goes too low? And so the receptor will always sit in the middle. And then the effector is going to sit at the top. And the other effector is going to sit at the bottom. And so if we look at these definitions, receptor and effector, they're organs. And so those are things, physical things. So the receptors are, and the effectors are going to be at the top and the bottom of this figure eight. And then these are actions. And so the stimulus and the response, and the stimulus and the response, so I put some arrows like this, those are going to be actions on either side. In other words, what it does, or what it sends, or what, it, what it's doing. And so those are the elements of the feedback loop. And so not only should you know negative, positive, but you should be able to say, what's the receptor? What's the effector? What's it doing? What's it, how's it working? And so let's try that with a little bit of practice. And so the example I gave you as far as feedback loops go is one of these speed signs. And so when you see a speed sign, then you, if you're going too fast, you may slow down. And if you're going too slow, you may speed up. And so let's define some of the uh, receptor and, and the effector. And so let's do our little, let me get a color here. And so I'm going to put a receptor in the middle. Now I could do a couple of feedback loops, but let's just deal with the person. And so what's the uh, receptor? Let's say the receptor is going to be your eye. It's going to be in the middle. What is an effector? Let's say a foot up at the top, and let's say your foot down here below. So if I say those are the organs, so we're going to put an eye, a foot, and a foot at the bottom. So this is going to be my receptor, and this is going to be my effector on either side. And so if, if, if we talk about specifically what the stimulus is, well, let's say the stimulus is that you're going, I don't know, we'll say 38 miles an hour. What's going to be your response? Your response is going to be slow down. Let's say that you're all of a sudden going 22 miles an hour. So that's going to be the stimulus. What's going to be the response? You're going to speed up. And so that'll feed back to the eye. And so what we're going to have is this feedback loop that's constantly going up here, and then down here, and then up here. But it's kind of keeping you close to that, that set point of that speed that we, that we want it to be. And so we have a negative feedback, negative feedback, and it's kind of keeping you in that, that little uh, center point. The example that your book constantly talks about, or all science books talk about, is a thermostat. And it's a great example. And so if we talk about how a thermostat keeps a room warm, well, the thermostat, so what are the, the, what are the nouns, what are the organs in this case? The thermostat is going to be the receptor. So we're going to put that right in the middle. We're going to have a furnace, which is going to be an effector, and then we'd have another furnace up here. So let's say that the temperature goes too high. So if the temperature goes too high, what is the furnace going to do? The furnace is going to turn off. Let's say the temperature goes too low, so that's an action, or our stimulus. What's our response going to be? Then it's going to turn on. And so those are just analogies, ways that you can understand how a feedback loop works. But remember, we're going to put the receptors and the effector at the top, at the bottom, and then right in the middle. And so that keeps us close to a, a set point. Now let's try to do some real ones in biology. So let's try and do thermoregulation. So thermoregulation. So we've got rid of their definitions over here. So we're going to put the receptor in the middle. So the receptor, in this case, is called the hypothalamus. 
Hypothalamus is going to be an organ. It's actually a, it's a little bottom part of the brain that drips down from the brain, um, the lower portion of the brain. It's connected to the pituitary. Um, but the hypothalamus is going to sense your temperature, so it's an organ. And so let's start with a receptor right here in the middle. And you may want to start with temperature. Okay, so let's say that we get too hot. So let's say that our stimulus is that the hypothalamus is getting too hot. What are some effectors that we could put at the top? Well, one example would be like sweat glands. Uh, what's another one? Capillaries. Ooh, like that. <laughs> My handwriting is not great. So well, let's say the temperature goes too high. Our organs at the top could be sweat glands, capillaries. So if it goes too hot, what are the sweat glands going to do? What's their response? Well, they're going to sweat. And that through evaporative cooling is going to lower our temperature. What are the capillaries going to do? If they get too hot, then they're going to dilate. So there's more blood going by the surface of your body. And so that's going to release more heat. And so that's going to lower our temperature as well. And so our response is going to depend on what the effector is. Let's say that our temperature goes too low. What are some things that could act down here? Well, capillaries again. So if capillaries before were dilating when we get too cold, then they're going to constrict. And so what that's going to do is hold more of your temperature close to the body. Uh, what's another one? Your muscles, for example. Our muscles could eventually start to shiver, and that's going to generate a little bit of heat. Um, we could have goosebumps where it holds our hair up on end, which doesn't really do much if you don't have a lot of hair. It's not like a dog, but it does kind of pull your skin in tight like a coat pulling in tight. It's going to hold more of that heat. And so this is our characteristic feedback loop where if it goes too high, we do these things. If it goes too low, we do these things. And so that keeps our body temperature near that set point right in the middle. Another example is, uh, is blood glucose. So blood glucose, if we think about that, we should maybe set up the organs first. And so what would the organ be in the middle? Well, the organ's gonna be the pancreas. So the pancreas, let's put that right in the middle. What are we gonna have if our blood glucose goes too, um, too high? Well, the, remember, the way I always do it is that we've got beta cells at the top and alpha cells at the bottom. Now what are those? Well, inside the pancreas, if we say the pancreas looks, well, it doesn't look anything like that, but the beta cells are going to be sp speckled over the surface of the pancreas. They're parts of what are called the islets of Langerhans. Uh, and then we're going to have alpha cells as well speckled around here. So they're sensing the blood glucose level. If the blood glucose level goes too high, uh, then what is our response? Well, the beta cells are going to secrete insulin. And so what does the insulin do? Insulin is going to hit insulin receptors on your cells. It's going to open up these glucose transports and glucose is going to start coming into the cell. Uh, let's say it goes too low. So if it goes too low, so this would be our, our, uh, our stimulus. What's going to happen? We're going to re release something called glucagon. And what glucagon is going to do is it's going to um, trigger the liver to break down glycogen into glucose and then release that into the, into the cells. And so um, we got this great feedback loop, which is going to keep our, our blood glucose levels about perfect. Why is it important that we keep our blood glucose levels perfect? It's because glucose is the fuel. And if we can't get that fuel to our cells, or if we use too much of it too quickly, then we're, then we're out, of, out of luck. And so the whole thing is built on this feedback loop where we constantly are keeping ourselves close to that set point as far as blood glucose goes. But remember, the whole thing, let's find a different color, is tied around these organs in the middle, so the receptors and the effectors, and then the stimulus and the response. And so when you ever see one of these figure eight diagrams in a book or anywhere, always be thinking back to the, to the wonderful elements of a, uh, a feedback loop. Nouns, actions, organs, actions. And I hope that's helpful.